Superficially, the Halvergate marshes are still reminiscent of the Middle Ages when they were first drained to provide the rich grazing land for which they've been much valued over the years. The same families have owned marshlands for generations. Cattle are still grazed in the marshes, but the traditional lettings from April to November are these days fetching a comparatively low price. The wind pumps were in operation right up until the 1920s, and winter flooding was an accepted hazard. With the gradual introduction of mechanical drainage, a way of life has been slowly disappearing. There are fewer wild fowl because they've lost their winter feeding ground. The marsh families have drifted away from what was always a bleak existence, even when there was an uncomfortable living to be made. Only few of their houses remain. Robin Harrison has walked the marshes since he was a boy 60 years ago. In his words, he's a marsh lover, but he says you can't put the clock back. Well, they think it is part of the broadened landscape, but I, I fail to see it is part of the broadened landscape. Actually, we're deep in marshland here, miles from the river, where any broad people, holiday people, would ever cruise along, and they wouldn't see these marshes on any time. And to walk down them in the middle of winter, I mean, there's nothing to come down here for, really, is there? But I love these marshes, I think, as they were in my early days, they were, there was always something of interest on here. The geese were here before I began to come here. They first arrived on these marshes, according to what we're told, about 1917. The pink feet were the first species to come, and from then on, but they built up in very large numbers to the peak. When I said I saw them in 1947, in the winter of 1947, we were out on these marshes at daybreak with two friends, and after the geese had all dropped in, we estimated between ourselves there were about 3,500 to 4,000 white fronts on about three marshes. The marshes were absolutely blue-grey with the geese. You couldn't see the grass for them. As I said there's no attraction for them here now, so we, whatever they do now, where they can serve a thousand acres of these marshes, they're never going to draw the geese back in this area no more, to my opinion, anyhow. Drained marshland is extremely fertile. Next door to Halvergate, on the newly drained Muckfleet Marsh, farmers can expect to get £106 for a tonne of wheat at the latest prices. And that price is currently guaranteed by the EEC, even though there's a surplus of grain in the community. The economic advantage of changing to arable is summed up by farmer Pat Hood, who has marshes in the red areas of Halvergate. These have been traditionally grazing marshes, but um, as I think um, most people in the country know, the profitability of keeping cattle, whether it be dairy farming or beef farming, um, has deteriorated in the last few years. And um, we, like um, a great many other farmers, have um, found it necessary to maximise the use of our land in the um, best economic way. And uh, therefore we have ploughed some of our marshes and grown wheat. And the return is um, at least 100, and I would put it nearer to 150 pounds an acre greater than it would be from, uh, from having the same marshes in cattle. There's never been any question about saving part of the designated area on the grounds of keeping its existing ecological pattern intact. It's a so-called area of special scientific interest. And even though the numbers of wintering fowl and geese have declined, the marshes still retain enough important uncommon species to attract the serious bird watchers. But they watch with apprehension the encroaching plough, and they doubt that the shovelers, the harriers and the swans will come back once the land's been drained. It would be a terrible shame if this arable does spread all over the marshes here, isn't it? Yeah. You can see over in that direction they've already started ploughing up, yeah. you know, not even waiting for drainage to go on. On the north side of the road by the Stracy is absolutely decimated you know, yeah. as far as wildlife goes. Few people would argue about the need to preserve the natural habitat of endangered plants and creatures, but saving a landscape from extinction is a much more nebulous matter. It's rarity value and distinctive character rather than inherent beauty that are the main criteria in the Broads Authority's choice of which area is to be safeguarded, the largest of which appears to be the most inaccessible. You can only get there by boat or train. 
majority of Halvergate is inaccessible, but on, on this side of this block you've got the railway line, so you can see it from the, from the railway line, and you've got the, the river, the river, the river, yeah, on the other side of this block, so it can be seen from both those areas, and there's a, also a footpath that goes along the river wall, and um, a lot of people get off at Burnie Mills to, to look at the windmill and visit the pump there, the pump and the, and the pub, so that uh, a number of people can see it from that, that, that location. What is it that's so special about the landscape? It's, uh, it's got a number of distinctive features. It's got the wind pumps, it's, it's got this a very open type of landscape, uniformly green with a sort of uneven grass texture. Um, it's got a, a crisscrossing system of dikes. It's got the grazing animals. It's got the little date, the, the gate units um, scattered over it. It's a, a very characteristic type of landscape. I, I would generally feel a loss if you couldn't come and see a, a habitat like this. And the fact that it's, it's rare nationally and it gives it added importance. We're trying to save um, a thousand acres of this that to be retained as grazing marsh. And that is a significant area. A lot of the wildlife that, that's found on these marshes can uh, survive in that 1,000 acres. And also we've gone for, for large blocks that are landscape units in themselves. But the conservationists are asking the farmers to keep the land looking the same, i.e. keep it as a grazing marsh, but that means a much smaller return for them. Is that fair? Um, well, uh, there, is, there will always be a demand for, for grazing on these marshes, um, particularly related to the dairy industry, and a lot of farmers in this area find dairying a profitable agricultural enterprise. That's not what they've been telling us. Well, I perhaps disagree with them on that. A number of them are still in dairying farming and they haven't taken the opportunity um, to get out under the golden handshake of the EEC. So if they're still in dairy farming, they presumably must find it profitable. The largest chunk of red areas, the very heart of the plan, is the stretch of marshes by Burnie Mill along the River Yare. If the Broads Authority plan were accepted, Farmer Stephen Wright would have to keep his marshes exactly as they are for the next 20 years. Um, we haven't got immediate plans to plough up, but we like the opportunity to make up our minds to plough it up if need be. You know, this is the whole point, it's the freedom of the farmer to do what he wants with his land. It's really all down to economics. Um, if we're told we can't plough the land, we must be compensated. Most farmers wouldn't argue when it comes to saving a species, but when it comes to saving a landscape, they're not so sure. Farmer John Sherman is not even convinced that the landscape is in danger of being destroyed. What will we have destroyed? The place will still be flat, the dikes will still be here, uh, we probably have to put another gate up, uh, but uh, the basic, cha basic change, well, I can't see that there will be any basic change. Uh, the skyline is the main thing. In fact, the biggest feature down here is the sky. Did you see the sky last night? Magnificent, wasn't it? I don't think we're going to change that. For a year now, the Broads Authority's Strategy Committee, which includes members from all sides, has been trying to reach a satisfactory agreement. Instead, it's reached deadlock. £65,000 a year for 20 years is the authority's final offer. 75% paid by the Countryside Commission, 25% by themselves, with an agreement to review in three years' time. How does it feel to be cast as the villain of the piece, as the farmer? Well, I'm not too keen about it, and I think uh, the press really have built this up into something really what it, it, that it isn't. Um, I'm sure that the conservationists would agree with me when I say that farmers in this area have cooperated fully with them, they've never uh, failed to talk and discuss matters with them. Uh, we don't know everything about what's in the dikes and this, that and the other. But having said that, we must make a living. And uh, at the end of the day, economics have got to come in with conservation. Farming and agriculture is a process of evolution, just as conservation is a process of trying to stop evolution. But you can't stop evolution in the end.